Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to also thank the Institute for International, Global, and Regional Studies for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be back here on the West Coast. I got my PhD here, um, just up the road in Santa Barbara. Um, so this is a photo that I um, took uh, in September 2010, seven months after the earthquake, or nine months after the earthquake in Haiti. Um, this is a, uh, a giant pile of rubble. It used to be a, ho uh, a hospital. Uh, what, the reason why it what grabbed my attention is because you can see uh, four different uh, na nations' flags. The Haitian flag is the uh, second to the right. You see the French flag in the back and the Canadian and in the, in the U.S. American flag. Uh, so it was sort of a, you know, there, there was a phrase of planting the flag, which was an impulse uh, for the foreign aid uh, in Haiti. Uh, why would they would want to claim rubble uh, is a question uh, that I think is provocative. So I'll leave this photo up um, while discussing some of the theoretical stakes uh, or the questions of the research. Um, while there's obviously nuance and a range, social science scholarship on aid, particularly development aid, tended to develop along two tracks. Practitioner scholars focus on dilemmas within aid. As a subset of this discussion, scholarship on NGOs, non-governmental organizations, analyze issues of accountability, relationship with the state and donors, and effectiveness, among other questions. Emblematic of the scholarship was a series of volumes by, edited by Edwards and Hume spanning the 1990s. Within anthropology during this time, a critical Foucauldian approach developed in the light of James Ferguson and Arturo Escobar, challenging the assumptions behind development. Building on this trajectory, Foucault's governmentality inspired the work on NGOs in the new century, including Chris Peterson here at UCI. These conversations remain quite distinct, and both tended to leave aid professionals unexamined for the most part, until Raymond Apthorpe's concept on Aidland, which inspired two edited volumes in 2011, tellingly from each of these two tracks. As such, this was an important corrective. One of the volume co-editors, Heather Hinman, published a 2013 ethnography on what she called Expatria, which focused on the everyday lives of foreign workers, both aid and foreign service, within Nepal. Other scholars, such as Thomas Yarrow, continued this concept. Apthorpe had a long career in, development, in the development world, and his experiences led him to a critical, if not cynical, analysis of the quote-unquote bubble that surrounds development professionals, which cannot be penetrated by, by accountability in others. Regarding Haiti, Anthropologist Timothy Schwartz has published now three books on this t in this tell-all, quote-unquote, insider narrative, all highly critical, with cutting accounts of bad behavior of a range of people within the aid industry. Elizabeth Harrison's text, which I shared to accompany this discussion, calls Aidland to task. For first being dated, next that it focused too much on the individual level, thus ignoring power and social context, and that it reifies categories of development professional and recipient. In my work in Haiti following the earthquake, Humanitarian Aftershocks, the second text to accompany today's presentation, I attempted to address the second. I agree with Harrison's concern that with too great a focus on the individual aid workers. There is no room for nuance in Schwartz's account. The scandal that followed the 2015 publication of an article called How the Red Cross Raised Half a Billion Dollars and Built Six Homes focused on the moral shortcomings of a particular aid agency. The Red Cross refuses definition as an NGO. Fans of anger were also, f uh, uh, flames of anger were also fanned by journalistic accounts, including documentaries, later followed by Republican candidate Donald Trump, closely linked with Breitbart News. The politicization of aid did appear to help Trump's candidacy, as he carried Florida with an estimated 80, 800,000 Haitian Americans with a comfortable margin. Even if the shortcomings with the response to Haiti's earthquake didn't end up as fodder for partisan conflicts, the public discussion and analysis tended to remain on the good versus bad NGOs or aid workers. Looking back at the $16 billion aid response, one can question whether Haiti represents the Waterloo of the NGO system, if not Clintonist internationalism anchored in public-private partnerships overall. It was the first time that NGOs received such an avalanche of negative attention and criticism within mainstream U.S. media and policy-making circles. The $16 billion question usually posed as, where did the money go? However, this is only part of the conversation. We must also ask, what did the money do? 
and interrogate the secondary damage that the humanitarian aid caused, what can be called humanitarian aftershocks. In addition, missing from this discussion is the context, political, social structures, the inequalities and reward structures that got in the way of do-gooding. Even if it were possible, I do not believe it is helpful to interrogate the moral worth of the tens of thousands of individuals, uh, which, which in our media framing only includes foreigners, despite the well-documented stories of solidarity by Haitians themselves. Good people with good intentions can do bad things, or better for some than others, for example. More importantly, this focus on foreigners is more than a little problematic, framing Haitian people out of the story ignoring their significant contributions. Put another way, does Aidland have a culture? And if so, what is it? I will be attempting to answer this question, and in so doing, building upon what UCI anthropologist Victoria Bernal, here in the audience today, and Indrapal Grewal termed the NGO form, zeroing in on identifying potential commonalities. But I will first attempt to distill the lessons Haitian people, from beneficiaries to directors of NGOs, learn from what Haitian filmmaker Raoul Peck called the fatal assistance. Um, so quick background, uh, there was an earthquake that struck Haiti, January 12, 2010. Uh, there was an estimate, uh, a, a wide range of uh, estimates about the death toll, and the lowest being Timothy Schwartz himself. Um, generally accepted at 230,000 people lost their lives in the earthquake. 1.5 million IDPs are internally displaced persons. That's one in six of Haiti's population. And it generated a $16 billion humanitarian response. 60% of US households contributed in 2010. 80% of African American households contributed in 2010. Bill Clinton uh, was named as the United Nations Special Envoy for Haiti. Um, his wife was the Secretary of State at the time. Uh, Bill Clinton's slogan for the earthquake response was that this would, that we would build back better. That um, my hometown of Chicago, there was a fire, uh, and the rebuilding of Chicago is, is an example of building back better. Um, on this part of the world, we have uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake, the earthquake in uh, 1906 in San Francisco. The, uh, the, the rebuilding is often posed as, we have a better city now. Um, the earthquake response uh, brought celebrities, including Sean Penn. He created an NGO called the JPHRO. Uh, George Clooney did a telethon. Um, Scarlett Johansson sold a handbag. The Hooters girls went to Haiti. Um, there was a lot of attention on this earthquake and the, the humanitarian response. So, what happened? Um, a few weeks ago, the United Nations uh, declared that they would end their UN military mission to Haiti, known as the French acronym of MINUSTA. Uh, Haiti, uh, Haitian individuals are very, very critical of the United Nations uh, because of two reasons. That they brought cholera to Haiti for the first time in over 130 years, which has killed over 10,000 Haitians, and also rampant <laughs> sexual abuse uh, of, the so, uh, of Haitian men and women uh, by, ha by foreign UN troops. Uh, this is an acrostic poem called Cholera. Um, uh, it's a, uh, this is the wall of the State University of Haiti where I teach. Uh, it says, um, conspiracy between NGOs and the government to eliminate the rest of the Haitians who didn't die in January 12th of the earthquake. This is a, just an example of some popular perceptions of NGOs. Uh, the Red Cross uh, noted in my brief introduction, there was a scandal of a an uh, article published in June 2015, over five years after the earthquake, uh, and Hurricane Matthew, which struck Haiti uh, last October, uh, triggered another aid response, but two orders of magnitude less in terms of the dollar amounts. 120 million as opposed to 16 billion dollars in aid, uh, even promised. But there was a campaign to not donate to the Red Cross. Haitian Americans were very upset with uh, the way that Red Cross handled uh, the 2010 earthquake. And notice uh, that ARC, the Clinton Foundation is also put under the limelight here. Uh, this is also at the State University of Haiti where I teach. Uh, this graffiti says, down with all NGOs. Um, so that will give you some sense. 
This is a photo that I got um, through WhatsApp on Sunday. Uh, this was a rainstorm that destroyed the bridge uh, in Port Salut. Uh, there, there's a video that accompanies this, uh, but it's in Creole, so I just thought I'd show the photo. Uh, this is a, um, a rainstorm. It wasn't a tropical depression, certainly not a tropical storm, to say the least about not being a hurricane. This is what a rainstorm can do to a place uh, af after $16 billion of aid. So if there's any question, was Haiti built back better? The answer is no. Um, so I did some follow-up research. If you're interested in research methods, I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, but I'm going to get you into the data. Um, people moved into lower income neighborhoods um, after the earthquake. Um, so 56% of people left the camps because of bad conditions. Um, because of their lack of water and sanitation, for example. Several camps closed after the cholera outbreak and there was no water or, or toilets in the camp. So people were fleeing the camps because they were afraid. Um, so if you look at the uh, journalistic accounts of the, uh, the humanitarian response, certainly when Bill Clinton was speaking, the number of IDPs, internally displaced persons, was the barometer for success. So that number going down was measured as the success story. Uh, this shows that uh, we need to be questioning that statistic. Not everyone that left the camps is a success story. 17%, so one in six, were forced out. At times through gunpoint or uh, arson or, or violence themselves. Uh, there are several instances of babies being killed uh, in the forced removal of, of IDPs. 62% of the people report worse ec economic activity and make less money now than when they live in the camps. 53% report access to health care was worse now than when living in the camps. At least when you, were had, when you had an IDP card and you were a statistic, there was some attention and some semblance of foreign responsibility for your well-being. After the people left the camps, that all went away. 47% uh, report their access to water was better, 36% worse since before the earthquake. <coughs> so I apologize for this photo, uh, but this does show in pretty graphic terms, this is uh, what NGOs can do to a place. This is a latrine that was installed by an NGO with photos taken when it was installed as a success story, but then 10 months later it was abandoned, or for the next 10 months it was abandoned. This brings up the issue of accountability within NGOs. Um, NGOs are accountable to who? Uh, there's been a lot of literature within NGO studies that NGOs have accountability to their donors, to the governments, and not to the, the recipients, not, to the, not, uh, not downward accountability. So we need to take a look at the current reward system. NGOs are very good at producing reports because the United States government and other donors require it. There's a couple aid watchdogs. Um, there's um, uh, also aid, so there's uh, websites that you can go visit to look up the 990, which is a, the IRS form that we require of NGOs. You can look at where did the money come from and where did the money go. Um, so there's a, uh, lots of organizations that, that are interested in your, your charity navigator rating, or um, other sort of uh, watchdog. Um, so th there's a question about accountability um, is more than just where the money come from and where to go. Um, so the picture that I show was a, was a, a camp called Colombi or Colombia. Uh, the Latines were abandoned for 10 months. Uh, there was a camp called Carade. Uh, it is uh, the, the NGOs created um, a place for people to live. They had um, there was uh, a camp there in, in advance, uh, but they were doing a relocation, and the people that the NGO moved from their one camp to the other all had temporary shelters, like plywood. You'll see a photo in a moment what, it, what the difference is. Um, but the first thing they did is they built a fence to keep other people out and to protect um, the, the, the elected people that were the haves. I, you could call them have-littles. I, I have a problem calling them haves, but... Uh, there was definitely, you'll see in a moment, uh, water and sanitation and hygiene services, uh, water and uh, latrines, for example. Uh, I did a study uh, 
in 2010 in a follow-up study after cholera 2011, uh, looking at all kinds of variables. Um, the, the one that was most significant in terms of the, the, the power to, uh, uh, to describe the statistical significance was whether a camp had an NGO management agency or a CMA. Um, so that's good news on the one hand. They're doing their jobs. The bad news is that camps are only 20% of camps had a camp management agency. So why weren't anyone saying, hey, step up? Um, because NGOs are private agencies and they don't have to do what, they're, what they don't want to do. Um, so, um, so we compared the, 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 water, the wash services, water sanitation, uh, before and after the cholera outbreak. 37.6% um, of camps didn't have access to water after the outbreak in 2011, whereas 40.5% had, did not have access to water before cholera. So there's an increase in 4%. That increase can be explained by a, a decrease in the denominator. So camps are closing because of people are, people's fear of cholera. So that's not a success. Um, there is there, uh, uh, 20, so again, 4% increase in the camps that, that have toilets. So out, so there is one place in, in where there was improvement in, a, in a, a, a municipality called Cite Soleil because the Haitian government said, we are going to make a goal to have 100% coverage of wash services in Cite Soleil. And it was NGOs that did the work, but they, um, they agreed to be coordinated and told what to do by the Haitian government. So not all NGOs good, not all government bad. Uh, I had to write nine drafts of an article because I was keeping on getting rejected or critiques because people did not want to have that be the conclusion, even though the data said as much. So um, anything that people notice about this particular picture that might be odd? Or so, hmm? Only women. Um, so th this is a food aid distribution. It turns out to be the last food aid distribution um, in 2010. This is uh, uh, Easter weekend. Um, uh, this woman here, I uh, gave her uh, some money on her cell phone, and I told her to call me when she's done, when she got her food. Notice what time it is, 1041 in the, in the morning. She had been in line since 11 p.m. the night before, waiting for food. She called me at 4.30. She was waiting a day, almost a full day to get her food aid. Um, the, the least nice thing I have to say about uh, the worst humanitarian aftershocks in Haiti is that aid paradoxically increased violence against women. Here's how. The aid went to women. So this is a, you could say this is a good progress, women in development, that um, World Food Program prioritizes giving food aid to women because they're, they're going to they're gonna spend it on their kids versus if you uh, give aid to men, they're going to spend it on their, uh, they'll, they'll buy beers or they'll, they'll spend it on their lover. I have quotes about this from, from aid workers. Um, so in the abstract, this policy may make sense. However, the decision makers were men. So you have ration cards, you have camp committees given you know, up to 3,000 ration cards to give out to, the, to, the, to women to receive the aid. What happens is transactional sex. Um, there are documented instances. Uh, in the book, we talk about a quote from a woman that says, only people with big, beautiful behinds are the ones getting the aid. And just to make sure that we made sure that we, we heard what we thought we heard, uh, the person responded by saying, beautiful four times. So she was 53, she never got food aid because she was not good enough. So small arms survey did a study. They found that 22% of women were victims of sexual assault in the camps in 2010. This compares to 2% outside the camps. Same study. So what's going on is uh, you have a, um, you have to, uh, have a, what black feminists call intersectionality. We need to be looking at multiple factors at once, not just gender. You can't just add gender and stir, or add women and stir. We have to be looking at all kinds of contexts, like class, like race, like, uh, like family status. 
And when aid um, flattens the complexity uh, and prioritizes just one variable of many, you have these kinds of perverse outcomes. So this is that photo I was telling you about. Um, in the very top, you see in the middle, there's a yellowish building. That's the US Embassy. Um, this is the camp uh, Karade. This is the only camp of the eight in my study, that I, uh, uh, the ethnographic study, that's still around. They now call it a village. Because to call it a camp means that, that the aid has failed. To call it a village means that there's no longer any responsibility uh, by the international agencies. Notice the difference between the houses on the top versus the houses on the bottom. So like I said, the first thing this NGO did is build that fence. So, um, so when faced with all these issues, uh, what was the response from aid agencies? Uh, there is a typical response to blame the victim. Haiti um, has a lot of bad press. Um, I, when, when I did a documentary film, I screened it in several college campuses. I asked people to write down the first word that comes to their mind when they hear the word Haiti. Out of 1,200 people, how many do you think raised their hand to say that, that first impression was positive? Out of 1,200 people. One. One person out of 1,200 had a positive impression of Haiti, and that was Wyclef. Um, Haiti's uh, bad press is not by accident. It was the only slave revolt that, re that resulted in free nationhood. It was the time that they kicked out the French. Uh, it paved the way for manifest destiny. In the United States, the Louisiana Purchase was, um, uh, was the result of the Haitian Revolution. Um, President Jefferson was only negotiating treaty rights to be able to use the Port of New Orleans. What he got was the western third of the country, where I'm from. Um, so if you look at this, um, ways in which, the, the, look at the disaster narrative, the stories that were coming um, to, through CNN, through Time, through all kinds of US corporate media, was that you had people that were looting. And they used the word looting. People are probably aware of the difference between, uh, in her, following Hurricane Katrina, white families were finding food, black families were looting. There was a racial uh, element to, the, to disaster coverage. In Haiti, that's just magnified. I know a journalist who um, said that one of these accounts, the, the, journal, the, the foreign, so a Haitian journalist, he was the camera person, um, literally, the foreign journalist threw a bunch of aid on the ground and then filmed uh, the conflict that ensued. So um, we need to be questioning this. Cheryl Mills was the Assistant Secretary of State for Hillary Clinton. And she made a comment like Barbara Bush uh, after Hurricane Katrina that uh, as hard as it went to believe that these people are living better than they were before the earthquake. So basically, Haitians are resilient. They don't need more. We can give them less. Uh, there was a very big, powerful discourse of NGO, to NGOs, to aid workers, and foreign journalists that, um, that people are faking it that they're not legitimate IDPs. Um, so this was the first, first instinct. Um, after year, and so if you, even if you didn't have these deliberate attempts at uh, pulling upon centuries of, of racist imagery about Haiti, um, even if you didn't have uh, specific stories, you did have specific stories in Huffington Post. I'm one of only three people that I know of that has independent voices uh, that weren't uh, NGOs uh, after the earthquake. The rest of the stories you were seeing about Haiti were, here's the great work that we're doing. And after lots of these stories, and, and you see lack of progress, most people will just resolve their cognitive dis dissonance by saying, well, Haiti's just a basket case. David Brooks said so. Uh, it's a defective culture. Um, Pat Robertson said it was a pact to the devil. So this is a way to blame Haitians. So after a while, this got old, and journalists were starting to dig deeper. And so then Bill Clinton in the UN Special Envoy's Office acknowledged three self-critiques. One, that there's a lack of coordination. If you don't have coordination, you're not going to have effective services. Two, uh, that you have a weak state. Um, and three, that uh, humanitarianism, and certainly camps, have, uh, if you think of a, your typical refugee camp, it's usually out in rural areas where you can control all aspects of people's existence. You can control the entrance and the exit, and what aid goes in, what aid goes, what aid goes out. The earthquake struck Haiti's capital city. Um, so 
there was uh, the, the, the urban realities when you have rural humanitarian toolkit, and they use the word toolkit. So these are on the Bill Clinton's uh, lessonsfromhaiti.org, uh, which is the official website for the Office of the Special Envoy. And Haiti is the inspiration for the transformative agenda for humanitarian aid by the United Nations. So Haitian people take this analysis a little bit further. Um, this is a book that was published. Um, uh, that's the, the title is The Failure of Humanitarianism, The Haitian Case. And so this, these are the aid workers. Um, the JPHRL, the Sean Penn's camp. Um, a graduate student that I've been working with, um, she had a wanted photo because she was doing research with her photo and said, call me, uh, call the number, which is basically their, their office. There is a lot of uh, discussion about um, you know, controlling all aspects of, ID of IDP's existence. So if we're going to take uh, this, this, so why does this aid by good people with good intentions um, not succeed? So the work that I'm trying to do now is interrogate there might be a culture of NGOs, that there may be something in common that is getting in the way. So um, first of all, anthropologists and others have talked about audit culture. So that you have to produce those numbers, you will focus on short term solutions because you can audit it. You're, you know you're going to have your books looked at, so you're, so you're going to be evaluated on your burn rate. They use the word burn rate. How quickly can you spend money? That was a criteria upon getting USAID funding after the earthquake. So this creates the environment by which NGOs uh, make decisions in part by what it looks like to the, to the auditors, to the, to the uh, donors, rather than what, what's best for people on the ground. Language. Um, that uh, I believe you use the word NGO speak uh, in your chapter. I, you know, we could call it NGO ease, aid speak. That there is, a, since there are young people in the room, uh, just a ton of um, jargon and acronyms that NGOs have to uh, learn. And they also have to learn what language um, to use uh, is English. Uh, the, Log, the UN logistics space where they were making decisions about the humanitarian response after the earthquake was in a military base. Uh, Haitian people were excluded. Um, you had to present your passport uh, because I'm white. I assumed that I um, would get treated differently. So twice I walked in without presenting my passport. I had it with me, but I wasn't asked for my passport. Um, these meetings were held in English. English is not one of the official languages of Haiti. French and Haitian Creole are. Um, so uh, literally, uh, NGOs may be speaking a language that only they can understand. A deliverable. What is a deliverable? What is um, you know a beneficiary? Uh, what is an actor? What is a solution? So these, these specific ways of learning this language um, is a way of marking who's in and who's out. Ritual. Um, so it, cultures have rituals. Uh, the ritual of the audit, the photo op, the presentation to the community, um, that, the, that the word participation has been ritualized. So it's a check the box. Did you have participation? Yes, no. Do you have a local committee? Yes, no. Um, the, 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 the rituals also include uh, initiation rites. Everyone talks about their favorite story, but where they blame Haitians for being stupid. Uh, that there is often the, the ways in which these stories are told, which um, basically says, are you in? Are you, are you out? So people's frustrations, either they are stuck with it or they did not. So these are all, can be read as initiation rights into the NGO culture, into Aidland. The, uh, Aidland is also about their insularity. People use the word bubble. Um, they have housing allowances, $2,500 a month compared to 300 I pay to share a three bedroom. Uh, we, we collectively pay $300 a month for our housing versus getting a, a Non-tax, a, a non-taxable housing stipend of twenty-five hundred dollars. Um, the kinds of food that I'm used to eating in the United States require refrigeration. They require all kinds of preservatives. They're foreign. Uh, where do you buy these? Uh, there are grocery stores that, that have all these foreign goods, but they're they're guarded by armed individuals. Um, so, and people are driven around. So it, one person said, if it wasn't for my driver, I wouldn't even hear Haitian music. 
So uh, there's again this climate of fear, uh, in part because of the Haitian Revolution, but in part because um, the way in which the aid culture is um, overall um, to be fearful of or separate from uh, the, the, the beneficiary populations. Uh, anthropologists use the word worldview, um, how we see the world. If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That was a quote that I was given. So if you are seeing people as mouths to feed, you don't see them as human beings with capacities, with ideas, with skills, with, with, with a part of their solution. Um, so, and this, uh, this comes with the, uh, the, the worldview is that they all have a story to tell, they all have a, they have a way of viewing the world that they are there to do good. And you have to believe in that in order to make sense of the, the contradictions of that work. In, so. so these are ideas I'm trying to you know, move on. Is there something that is common to all NGOs, to the NGO forum? Um, this is the People's Tribunal um, to judge the U.S. occupation 101 years after the fact. Um, U the U.S. Marines invaded Haiti in July 2000, uh, 1915, and this was a, a popular movement, a coalition of organizations, to talk about um, that this occupation is never fully ended. And so they do use the word humanitarian occupation to discuss this. So whatever um, self-critiques that, that NGOs make offer themselves, Haitian people move along the analysis a little bit further. Uh, to, for example, they use the word humanitarian occupation. Um, that they do feel like they're being occupied. They do feel they treated like dogs. There are so many quotes. Uh, I wasn't out there to look at this stuff, but when I was reading the transcripts, the, the word came up over and over again, being treated like animals or worse than animals. Um, Haitian professionals talk about NGOs being internally colonized. So that you ha that people were who are in their 50s were suddenly demoted and working for for someone who's foreign half their age, who doesn't know the culture, who doesn't know the language, who doesn't have that Rolodex. And the, the worst part of this is that there were, ev so the big 10 NGOs, the Save the Children's, the World Visions, the CARES, the Catholic Relief Services, Oxfam, every single one of those NGOs replaced their national director within three months after the earthquake. So these are, these are for, except for one person, they're all foreigners. But what that means is that if, you don't, if your local director cannot speak the language, doesn't know who to call if there's, a solu if there's a problem, doesn't know who to trust to get the work done, you have all these people that are the humanitarian superstars that don't know how to push aid, and they're creating these kind of conflicts that they're then documenting and blaming Haitians for. Language. Um, the people that are recipients speak Creole. The frontline workers speak Creole. The people at log bases are speaking English. So within an NGO, you have a literally an inability to communicate. So problems identified in the field are not being translated up in a log base. Decisions from log base are not being implemented <coughs> on the ground. You can blame Haitians for that. You can call them whatever you want. Or you can say there's a structural problem when the decision makers are not the implementers. So again, exclusion. So the the fact that, that a foreign military base was where the decisions were being made about them, that in the development the arena um, was the Interim Haitian Reconstruction Commission, or CARH in, in Creole, or in French, was co-chaired by Bill Clinton and the Haitian Prime Minister. In order for this to work, they asked the Haitian Parliament to vote to dissolve itself. After the, the, the UN gave Haiti cholera, there was a meeting scheduled on my birthday, December 14th, and they were moved from Haiti to the Dominican Republic because the foreigners were worried about getting cholera. But because of the, 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 the history of racial animosity between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, the entire Haitian delegation was excluded from that meeting. There were seven billion dollars of projects that were voted on at that meeting. To give an example. Um, so humanitarian is often presented as universal. So the, the humanity as a subject, humanitarian values, the toolkit, the household structure, the gender policies, they're supposedly universal. However, um, Haitian people are pointing out the model of family or household, the nuclear family, which is the, the cultural norm, if not the statistical norm here, is not what's practiced in Haiti, for example. So aid broke up the households. Um, 
that aid was about the photo op. Um, so if you're staging things to, like that long line of people waiting for food or water, it's because you can show your donors, hey, look at what we're doing. There's hundreds of people waiting for aid. Versus taking a tenth of that money and, and asking the question, where did, you get your, where did you get your water before the earthquake? And then one would say, yeah, that public tap right across the street, you can repair that tap in a much, much more cost-effective way uh, rather than having to truck in water from these two water companies that are both connected to the government and the Clintons, by the way. So this is about humanitarian is a, is a market. There's a market logic to humanitarian. So these photos were able you know, to plant the flag. Uh, these were co uh, in competition with one another to see who can get greater aid, who can justify a greater use of that aid. That there is a market logic behind humanitarianism, despite our belief that we're there to do good. So uh, this is a, the earthquake anniversary, the seventh year this year, um, January 12, 2017. This is at the Camp Karadim. So there are folks that are trying to bridge activists, NGOs, camp residents and universe, public universities. This is a conference we had interrogating the humanitarian response. So I'm going to end with some solutions that Haitian people suggested uh, from the, my research, and I'd be very happy to have questions and answer them for you. So solidarity, not charity. People do not want to be treated as a charity case. They do not want to be treated like a mouth to feed. They want to be treated as a human being who in solidarity with other people. That they want to be treated like humans, not like dogs, not worse than dogs. They do see affinity to, for example, and they use this, they, they, they are aware of Black Lives Matter and they are, and they are seeing the, the, the convergence of these, uh, these strategies and the discussion and the, the goals. Um, connect local jobs to the need and the training. A brilliant question that I still can't answer fully is this. You have $16 billion of aid you have people in this camp who are doctors, who are nurses, who are teachers, who are bricklayers, and you have people that need education, housing, and health care. Why not connect the money with the skills to the need? That would make a lot of sense, but that's not what happened. In part because people were not treated as people with ideas and skills. They were treated as needs to be met. Uh, re re you can rebuild the local government through contracting and logistics. Humanitarian aid is way more expensive because of logistics. It was the factor in someone dying or someone being rescued from the rubble. So rather than having the big NGOs do that work themselves, they can contract with the government and say, we need this hospital rebuilt. Go rebuild it. Here's some funds. We need this road in order to save people's lives. Go rebuild it. That's not the humanitarian impulse. It's to work around the government. We can change the reward structure. Um, that we really talk about inclusion and participation and prioritization. What are the needs that people identified? versus just giving them soap. Uh, a lot of people are saying that they, they feel insulted when what they're being given is soap and being told how to wash their hands, like their children. What they asked for was a job. What they asked for was housing. What they got was soap. And so one in one of the camps in the study that I did, um, people actually pr protested after waiting in line since midnight till, you know, till, till midday and what they got was four bars of soap and some aqua tabs. So some people are like, this is bogus, and they, they, they protested. And the UN troops shot rubber bullets, and a woman who was pregnant was killed. Um, so we could use a carrot approach, um, the carrot and the stick. So if, they, if, we be, if Bill Clinton and others say that a weak state is a problem and coordination is a solution, then fund it. <coughs> the only donor that did that was the Spanish government. They, they did fund coordination, because it does take money to have a computer, to have motorcycles, and have staff. So if that's what, it, if that's what we say we need, then we could voluntarily uh, tax um, our aid and say, OK, some of this money needs to go to the Minister of Education, of Housing, of Agriculture, and the local governments, the municipalities. So uh, we can change how we contract with NGOs. Um, think about accountability. Um, People in Haiti were talking about new minimum standards. That they don't want to see pictures of naked or near naked people uh, without their teeth. Um, just poverty pimping. They want to see people in dignity. They want to see the plan. Millennials, uh, actually, in our country, want to see what the money actually going to and not just the emotional appeal. 
So there's new ways uh, uh, that humanitarian aid could be, could be done. Um, people are asking for new minimum standards. So there are solutions Im implied um, that Haitian people have identified. And with that, I will pause. And then um, we have half an hour for questions if you have them. These are the undergrads that did the research with me from my previous job at York College. Um, this is the Citadel. So this is my way of saying thank you to all these people. I wouldn't have been able to do this research without them. <laughs>